Euh, le 26 février dernier, j'ai eu le grand honneur de présenter à la Chambre des communes notre rapport provisoire intitulé « Premier volet d'une étude sur les contre-coups de la pandémie de la COVID-19, le fardeau humanitaire, soutenir une réponse mondiale pour atteindre les plus vulnérables ». I would like to begin by expressing my sincere gratitude to the clerk, analysts, interpreters, and technical and media support staff who continue to support our committee throughout the pandemic and without whom this work would not have been possible. Before turning the floor over to my colleagues, I would like to make a, brief, a few brief opening remarks on this interim report. Most importantly, I believe that the recommendations and contents of this report do reflect a consensus among members of the committee. Bien que les membres du comité puissent partager des opinions et des points de vue divers, je voudrais souligner que ce rapport et ses dix recommandations ont été adoptés à l'unanimité. Comme l'ont dit de nombreux témoins qui ont comparu devant le comité dans le cadre de cette étude, les vulnérabilités déjà présentes avant le début de la pandémie se sont aggravées dans beaucoup de pays en situation de fragilité. De plus, les effets indirects de la pandémie les contre-coups auront probablement les conséquences plus importantes et à plus long terme que la pandémie elle-même. As the government of Canada and the international community respond to these significant humanitarian needs created and exacerbated by the pandemic, our committee, through this report, draws attention to aspects which we believe could be strengthened. It is my hope that the world's collective attention remains on the most vulnerable populations in our midst. As COVID-19 has highlighted our interdependence and shared vulnerabilities, this report points to the importance of having a coordinated, timely and needs-based response at the international level. With the real threat of a reversal in progress towards achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the committee focused on these broader issues of human dignity, humanitarian relief and development. Avant de conclure, j'aimerais également souligner le caractère provisoire de ce report. Ce rapport visait à offrir une vue d'ensemble de la crise. Le comité a commencé et même presque terminé la deuxième partie de son étude sur la COVID-19, dans laquelle on examine plus particulièrement les effets de la pandémie sur les enfants. J'espère que le comité adoptera également un rapport unanime sur ce deuxième volet de notre étude, dont le sujet est d'une importance vitale. And uh, I would now like to invite my colleagues to speak. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the floor goes to Ms. Sahota. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I'd like to just begin by outlining uh, some of the findings in this study. I think the study was uh, to all of the members, a very important first part of the study. As the chairs mentioned, there are um, we are continuing to study this matter uh, as it affects women and children um, and human rights uh, in the future as well. But right now, uh, to date, uh, we've heard that 95 million people around the world have been affected uh, by the COVID-19 virus and that over 2 million have died. Um, through all the different, uh, and today especially, I'd like to point out that today is you know, March 11th and it marks one year since the World Health Organization uh, announced uh, this pandemic. And uh, through this study, we have seen that um, in conflict situations and humanitarian crisis, uh, this pandemic has had a really negative effect, uh, whether it is directly, but also indirectly. We've heard from many of the witnesses that came before committee that the indirect effects in these areas have been uh, devastating. Um, and some of the indirect effects that uh, we've been feeling uh, that were mentioned by uh, the witnesses in particular are uh, food insecurity, poverty, um, the impacts, the disproportionate impacts it's had on women and children. And of course, access um, is one of the main uh, difficulties that a lot of the NGOs and charities have been having in getting into these regions because of the restrictions of COVID-19. Uh, so it has really had a a devastating impact uh, on many areas in the world. And uh, a lot of the witnesses fear that this impact will be long lasting uh, consequences, uh, more long lasting than the pandemic itself. Therefore, I know that all of the committee members felt very strongly in uh, coming together with their recommendations through consensus that um, 
the government of Canada has done much, but more needs to be done. And uh, I can say that uh, even through what we have heard in the recent throne speech and from uh, the prime minister himself and uh, the minister that they are open to doing even more. Um, in response to some of the questions uh, that may come up later, I'd like to address uh, some of the work that Canada has been doing in the area of helping uh, relieve uh, world, the world from this pandemic so that uh, the indirect effects that have uh, been felt by people around the world uh, can be uh, not as long lasting as what we fear and what many of the witnesses have mentioned. Um, some of some of the really devastating things that um, we've heard and I'm sure keep us all up at night uh, have been very difficult to hear about um, are situations that uh, especially young children and uh, women have been going through. And we've heard about an increase in child marriages, an increase in um, female genital mutilation, an increase in hunger. Um, and the increase is you know, you can see through the report is uh, quite severe. And so what I would like to say uh, to Canadians and uh, anyone, everyone listening today is that this study, I think, is a real eye opener and is one that um, that I think many people should take a look at so that uh, moving forward, uh, we recognize the true need uh, when it comes to humanitarian aid in the world and how Canada has been playing a leading role and how Canada should continue to play a leading role. And I hope that uh, in the coming years and months that uh, we continue to get that support from Canadians and from all political parties across, um, you know, across all partisan lines that we Canada continue to lead and uh, that Canada should, uh, should be investing as much as possible into uh, foreign aid. Um, and, you know, it's regrettable that at times we've heard uh, parties mention otherwise, but it was really good to work with all the parties uh, along around this committee, uh, virtual committee table to agree that, you know, Canada is in the right direction and should continue uh, to increase foreign aid and assistance as it has been year over year. Ms. Sahoda, thank you very much. Uh, the floor now, floor now goes to uh, Mr. Chung. Please go ahead, sir. Merci, uh, Monsieur le Président. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, this report follows on two previous reports that have come out in the last six months. We had a report last August from Bob Bray titled, A Global Crisis Requires a Global Response, um, a report that touched on Canada's uh, foreign aid commitments. Il a dit dans le rapport que le Canada a un engage, engagement depuis longtemps comme un pays riche à consacrer 0,7% de leur revenu national brut à l'aide publique au développement, connu sous le nom APD. He said in that report that Canada has never come close to that number, and if our rate this year looks slightly better than last year's, it is only because the gross national income number is stagnant, if not declining. Last October, we had a report from the World Bank uh, that estimated uh, that extreme poverty ex is expected to rise in 2020 for the first time in over 20 years. La Banque mondiale estime que l'extrême pauvreté mondiale devrait augmenter en 2020 pour la première fois en plus, en plus, de, en plus de 20 ans en raison de la perturbation de la pandémie COVID-19. In that report, the World, World Bank estimated that the pandemic is estimated to push an, an additional up to 100 and 50 million people into extreme poverty by this year. Uh, defined extreme poverty defined as le living on less than $1.90 a day. And now this report. I'd like to draw members of the press gallery uh, to two particular areas of the report, uh, figures one, two, and three, 
which uh, visually demonstrate uh, Canada's overseas development assistance spending. Uh, their charts clearly demonstrate that Canada's ODA has declined under the current government by some 10% relative to the previous government. Canada's ODA now sits at 0.27% of gross national income, well behind countries um, in our peer group, such as uh, the United Kingdom, Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland, France, Belgium, uh, New Zealand, and so many others. I'd also like to draw the members of the press gallery's attention to recommendation eight, uh, which calls on the government uh, to clarify its intentions with respect to uh, foreign aid spending, particularly important in light of this report and in light of the report uh, of uh, Ambassador Ray last summer and in light of the report from the World Bank indicating for the, for the first time in 20 years there will be an extreme jump in poverty falling, uh, resulting from the fallout of this pandemic. I'd also finally like to uh, draw to the attention of members of the press gallery recommendation 10, which calls on the government to clarify when it is, what it plans to do with redistributing excess vaccines, particularly important uh, because the government has indicated it will not redistribute any vaccines to developing countries until every Canadian is vaccinated. And it has also indicated that it will be the only G7 country to take advantage of the COVAX vaccine facility. So it's an important report uh, that highlights some of the shortcomings of the government's response. And I think it was a it's a constructive report, a facts fact based report that helpful hopefully will encourage the government to do better. Merci à tous. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chang. Uh, merci beaucoup. Maintenant, j'aimerais passer la parole à Monsieur Bergeron. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Euh, merci euh, à mes deux collègues. Euh, dont, dont je ne répéterai pas ce qui a été dit par l'un et l'autre, l'une et l'autre de nos deux collègues. Euh, je suis largement en accord avec euh, les propos qui ont été tenus jusqu'à présent. Euh, J'aimerais euh, signaler que j'ai toujours pensé et répété que les affaires étrangères se prêtaient euh, très mal à, euh, aux, jeux aux jeux partisans. Or, bien que le comité rencontre présentement de petites difficultés passagères euh, à ce chapitre, et, et je pense que les commentaires de mes deux collègues euh, traduisent un peu ces petites difficultés passagères, euh, le sujet d'étude retenu par le comité et ce rapport, ce premier rapport intérimaire unanime témoigne, je pense, du fait que nous, nous pouvons et nous devons travailler euh, de façon euh, solidaire euh, du côté des affaires étrangères. Euh, D'une part, parce que je crois que sur le sujet, nous partageons des valeurs qui sont euh, relativement euh, communes. Et d'autre part, je crois qu'en matière d'affaires étrangères, il est toujours plus... Euh, pertinent et utile de parler euh, d'une seule voix. Alors, euh, Monsieur le Président, euh, je disais que le, projet, le sujet d'étude de ce comité témoigne euh, du fait que nous avons su mettre de côté nos divergences de vues pour travailler de façon euh, solidaire sur un sujet qui euh, retenait l'attention euh, et qui a fait consensus au sein du comité. Je veux revenir un peu en arrière. Monsieur le Président euh, signalait euh, le moment où il a été euh, élu président de notre comité, au moment où le comité a entrepris ses travaux. Nous euh, avons dû nous interroger sur ce qui allait retenir l'attention euh, des membres du comité au cours des, des mois suivants. Et euh, nous nous sommes entendus à ce moment euh, sur le fait que nous allions euh, nous pencher sur la situation des populations vulnérables dans le monde. Or, euh, les travaux ont été brutalement euh, interrompus avant même qu'ils ne se mettent en branle par la pandémie et le confinement. Et le comité des affaires étrangères et du développement international a été... Euh, les travaux ont été suspendus pendant de très longs mois et lorsque nous avons euh, été confrontés aux effets de la pandémie, et je souligne que nous soulignons aujourd'hui, nous signalons aujourd'hui euh, euh, le premier anniversaire de cette pandémie, euh, j'ai donc une pensée évidemment pour toutes les malheureuses victimes 
de euh, la COVID-19. Mais lorsque nous avons pris conscience de l'ampleur des conséquences de la pandémie, euh, plusieurs euh, membres du comité, dont les vice-présidents, euh, y compris le président de l'époque, M. Levitt, avons euh, réfléchi informellement à euh, ce que nous devions faire pour demeurer pertinent parce que nous avions euh, constaté un effondrement euh, de tous les mécanismes de solidarité internationale, euh, en partant de l'OMS, euh, en passant par euh, l'Union européenne, euh, les différents accords euh, de libre-échange. Il y a eu un effondrement des mécanismes de solidarité internationale où on a cité un très malheureux « chacun pour soi » et euh, il nous est rapidement venu à l'esprit qu'il nous fallait nous pencher sur euh, ce qui s'était passé euh, euh, aux premières heures de la pandémie pour que les, ces mécanismes s'effondrent de telle sorte et ce qui devait être fait pour la suite, euh, puisque l'OMS nous annonce d'éventuelles euh, autres pandémies, ce qui devait être fait pour euh, que la réponse et la préparation à toute autre éventuelle pandémie puisse être... Euh, euh, de meilleure qualité, de telle sorte que nous puissions euh, minimiser les impacts d'une éventuelle future pandémie. Donc, lorsque les, le comité a repris ses travaux, nous avons dû nous interroger sur euh, ce que nous devions faire. Et certains d'entre nous souhaitaient poursuivre euh, l'étude euh, que nous avions convenu d'entreprendre, soit celle sur les populations vulnérables, alors que d'autres, dont j'étais, souhaitaient euh, effectivement que nous nous penchions euh, sur... Euh, la réaction mondiale, la réponse mondiale et celle du Canada euh, à cette pandémie et ce qui devait être fait pour la suite des choses. Et entre autres, grâce à Mme Sarota, qui a pris la parole un peu plus tôt euh, ce matin, euh, nous, avons, nous sommes parvenus à un compromis qui nous a permis d'entreprendre cette étude euh, fort pertinente dont euh, nous avons dévoilé euh, le premier rapport intérimaire unanime euh, récemment, comme le soulignait M. le Président, et dont on fait état dans le cadre de la présente euh, conférence de presse. Et euh, comme le soulignait le Président, nous achevons le deuxième segment de cette étude et devrions euh, sous peu euh, produire un deuxième rapport intérimaire qui, je l'espère aussi, sera euh, unanime. Je n'ai pas de raison de penser le contraire. Je crois que nous avons eu droit à euh, une, une série d'excellents de, témoignages extrêmement euh, poignants, euh, révélateurs de la situation qui a cours présentement, euh, dans lequel on constate que les populations vulnérables ont vu leur situation être exacerbée, pour ainsi dire, euh, de vulnérabilité exacerbée par euh, les effets de la pandémie. Et euh, je tiens donc à remercier euh, ces témoins qui, depuis déjà plusieurs semaines, plusieurs mois, euh, nous éclairent de leur, de leur témoignage et euh, remercier les collègues pour ce travail euh, solidaire euh, de collaboration qui s'est effectué jusqu'à présent. Et j'ose espérer que nous serons retrouvés cet esprit de collaboration qui euh, préside à nos travaux depuis les débuts et euh, que nous pourrons euh, continuer cette étude pour en arriver à des conclusions qui puissent être éclairantes tant pour le gouvernement du Canada que pour éventuellement d'autres juridictions. Je vous remercie, M. le Président. Merci beaucoup, uh, M. Bergeron. Uh, I'd like to now pass uh, the procedure over to the clerk for the moderated portion and invite members of the press corps to ask questions. Madam, Mr. Chair, can I give my intervention as well? My, my apologies, Ms. McPherson. I did not see that you were with us. Yes, absolutely. Please go ahead. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. So I'd like to follow up on the comments that my colleagues have said ahead of me. Um, I was happy that we were able to work together on this project, on this report. COVID-19 has had deep, extraordinary, damaging impacts on the most vulnerable members of society. People who were already st struggling with poverty, who were already marginalized, who were already ex suffering the devastating impacts of conflict and displacement. And while I'm deeply concerned that COVID-19 has made dire situations so much more dangerous, I want to highlight that Canada and the world was already failing to protect many of these people. And like so many other examples we've seen during this pandemic, the cracks that were already in place before the pandemic struck have become wider, 
and the inequality and injustice has become greater. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. All the witnesses that we heard spoke of the long tail of COVID-19. In fact, one witness told us COVID-19 has a long tail with a poisonous barb at the end. We heard of impacts on women and girls, how girls are leaving school, leaving them vulnerable to early marriage, sexual exploitation, and diminished opportunities in the future. We heard how violence against women has skyrocketed and how access to birth control and health resources has shrunk. We've been warned um, about the significant invest investment in food insecurity that is almost a certain reality and that could cause starvation in parts of the world if, if, if we don't reflect, if we don't respond to this. And finally, I firmly believe that ensuring COVID-19 vaccines are shared in an equitable and fair way to all vulnerable people in all countries will be the most important and ethical decision that this generation will make. We heard testimony on what will happen if we fail. If Canada fails to work with donor countries for the global good, millions more people will unnecessarily die. Dangerous variants will increase threatening Canadians and our global economic um, recovery. Um, and this will take years, if not decades, to correct. This government's decision to take COVAX vaccines while hoarding 10 times what Canadians need through bilateral agreements and to deny poor countries access to vaccines through the intellectual property waiver at the WTO shows that they are not making the right decision. And if Canada does not act with morality, with, with interest in the greater good, in protection of humanity, that will be a stain on our reputation and more importantly, a moral failing of the worst kind. Canada has to do better on the world stage. We need to increase our over official development assistance. We can be ambitious in our response to COVID-19. We can commit to 1% of our spending and we can be the leaders we once were. We need to be. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. McPherson, thank you very much uh, for your opening comments, and uh, I would now like to turn it over for the moderated portion of uh, the press conference. Thank you very much. We'll now start the question period. As usual, we will have one question and one follow-up. S'il vous plaît, identifiez-vous avant de poser votre question. Operator, could we have a first question on the phone, please? Thank you. Merci. If you have a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. Si vous avez une question, faites étoile un pour toute question. The first question is from Stephanie Levitz from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking the call. Um, Ms. McPherson, I wondered if I could just pick up on something you just raised about what's happening at the WTO, and if you could flesh that out a bit in the context of this report, but also uh, for you and your fellow MPs, what your thoughts are on what Canada should do. So, so yesterday, earlier this week, actually, I asked a question in the House of Commons um, of the government on whether or not they were planning on on supporting South Africa and India's call for an IP waiver to allow vaccines around the world to, to, to waive the intellectual property rights. Um, the minister at the time said that they were open to that, but we know now that yesterday that Canada voted with Big Pharma against making vaccines more accessible around the world. It is incredibly disappointing. I think that what we're seeing right now is, is donor countries, wealthy countries, hoarding vaccines, making sure that they are, they are um, 
keeping all of the vaccines within their own countries when we know when good public health policy means that we need to have vaccines distributed amongst the most vulnerable around the world. It's, it's good health policy in that less people will die. It's also good health policy in that less dangerous variants will develop, will have an opportunity to develop and potentially infect Canada again. But it's also really good economic sense because if we don't act this way, if we don't have a, a strong global response, uh, it will take years, if not decades, for our economic recovery. That means it'll be years before we're able to travel internationally the same way that we once did. Uh, so our airline industry will be impacted. It will take years for, for all kinds of the industries that we need, that we depend on. I mean, we have a global economy. If we don't do a good job of our response to this, uh, it will take so much longer and the, the impacts will be devastating. It truly is a moral and ethical question, and it is truly a moral and ethical question that this government is failing on. Can I get the point of view of um, your liberal and conservative colleagues on this? I mean, should we be supporting this motion? And then to go further to your recommendation in the study about dedicating our own privately procured supply of vaccines for developing countries, I mean, or taking from COVAX right now, like how do we reconcile both of those things? Okay. Sorry, I think so, you were looking I, for one of the other MPs. Yes, I, yeah, I was I mean, just like waiting to see more. if. Oh. Sure, I was waiting to see if my conservative colleague wanted to jump in first. Um, uh, this is Ruby Sahoda, and thank you for your question. Uh, I want to just reiterate that uh, in last February in 2020, uh, Canada was one of the first countries to work um, with the WHO. Um, work with Gavi to create uh, this shared uh, global vaccine procurement strategy, uh, COVAX. And it was always um, from the, four, you know, if you look at the contracts and the agreements that were um, created at that time, the incentive for countries to participate uh, was that uh, you would invest in this and you would also be able to procure for your own country uh, along with being able to distribute much more uh, to other countries of lower income. And so I'm actually proud. I'm proud that Canada was one of the first. I'm proud that Canada has committed, uh, is one of the highest um, donating countries at this time uh, into COVAX. So we have committed 1.6 billion um, overall to the global response when it comes to COVID-19 uh, for tools accelerator uh, to support equitable access to the COVID-19 tests, treatments, vaccines, uh, and that includes like helping set up the COVAX facility. So had it not been for Canada's support, uh, Canada's contributions, uh, we would not see uh, the distribution of what is going to be over 2 billion vaccines being given to lower income countries. And we're already seeing uh, those vaccines roll out and those that are in need for those vaccines are starting to receive those vaccines. So uh, I think Canadians should be proud of our contributions. Uh, in terms of uh, what we are receiving uh, ourselves, it is a very small portion. It is what was agreed upon initially. And Canada is not close to the idea, you know, what was brought up before, um, and it's one of the recommendations in our report as well, about making vaccine donations when we're in a position to do so as well. Uh, so we, you know, through Last December, we set up a program, a mechanism that allows all countries to donate or exchange surplus vaccines um, through Gavi. And so I think you know, Canada's involvement really has set the stage and is helping countries to be able to deal with uh, procurement as well as distribution to all these countries and to make sure there's no wastage at the same time so that uh, those vulnerable people around the world um, get the vaccines that they need. Uh, of course, we have vulnerable Canadians as well. And so through our procurement strategy, we want to make sure that uh, those vulnerable Canadians are also protected. Um, but that is not at the um, at the risk of not providing for other countries. I would say it's actually to the contrary, uh, you know, in, in that I negate that comment um, or I, um, I, 
I don't believe that because uh, we are procuring from COVAX that countries will not receive. I think uh, it's the opposite of that. It is because we got involved. It's because we've invested uh, that so many countries around the world and vulnerable populations will be receiving vaccines. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, maybe I could, uh, Mr. Chair, can I uh, respond to Ms. Ms. Levitt? Yes, Mr. Chong, it's a free discussion in response to the journalist. Yes, absolutely. So I, Thanks, I think uh, your question, I, I think your question highlights um, a problem with this government's approach to foreign policy and particularly uh, with its approach in this report to the COVAX uh, facility and to Gavi. Um, this government came to office with grandiose promises about helping the poorest in the world. It was a commitment that they made in the 2015 campaign. They promised to lift the poorest in the world out of poverty um, and use soaring rhetoric uh, to describe what they were going to do if they were to form government. Uh, but the facts say otherwise. And that that is a consistent pattern with this government's approach to a range of foreign policy issues. You know, they came to office with these grandiose promises, and yet they cut foreign aid by 10 percent relative to the 10-year average under the previous Conservative government, um, something mm -hmm. that Ambassador Ray pointed out in his report, which is on the Government of Canada's website, a report that he uh, finalized last August. Um, this is particularly concerning, as my colleague Madame McPherson has pointed out, because of the extraordinary events of the last uh, 12 months. Uh, the world has made tremendous progress in reducing extreme poverty in the last several decades, uh, progress that had lifted hundreds, billions of people out of extreme poverty and significantly reduced that extreme poverty. But in the last 12 months, as the World Bank's October report indicated, uh, it is estimated that for the first time in 20 years, uh, that trend will be reversed, and up to 150 million citizens, many of them in middle-income countries, will be plunged back into extreme poverty, defined as living on less than $1.90 a day. Uh, and so in that context, the government's failure to deliver uh, foreign aid at the levels that were, at, uh, that were in place previously is, has real consequences. Its decision on vaccine contracts and on uh, accessing the COVAX facility also uh, is particularly uh, concerning in this context. Um, my view is that the government uh, did a poor job of negotiating these vaccine contracts last summer. They were late in negotiating them relative to our peers. And as a result, uh, to compensate for the lack of early vaccines in any significant quantity, they instead uh, decided to uh, negotiate contracts that uh, provided more doses per capita than any other country on the planet. And that's why we find ourselves in this position today. Um, and to add uh, insult to injury, uh, the government uh, indicated because it didn't negotiate contracts with, which would provide a significant number of doses up front, that they were also going to rely on the COVAX facility as a backup. And so, um, you know, that's how we find ourselves in this situation today. Um, it's part of a broader pattern of the government's rhetoric vastly exceeding uh, their actions. Can I do, do a quick follow-up? I do Monsieur, want to point out Monsieur that... Monsieur um, le Président? Oh, yes. Um, if, we can, if I can just interrupt uh, the member of the press for a moment and give uh, Monsieur Bajeron the chance to add his comments. Uh, la parole est à vous, Monsieur Bajeron. Merci beaucoup. Uh, bien que je n'ai pas été invité à donner uh, mes commentaires sur ce point, uh, je crois que uh, j'ai quand même quelque, quelque chose à dire. Comme on peut le voir, à, à la lumière des réponses qui ont été données par les collègues, il y a à boire et à manger pour tout le monde. Uh, je pense qu'effectivement, uh, le gouvernement peut se targuer de certaines réalisations et permettre à Mme Saota de dire qu'elle est très fière euh, de, du gouvernement. 
mais je crois que cela ne doit pas nous empêcher de nous poser un certain nombre de questions. Un certain nombre de questions sur le recours à l'initiative COVAX, euh, sur des questions quant à notre contribution à l'initiative COVAX et euh, sur la question plus particulière des, des brevets euh, de la part des compagnies pharmaceutiques qui ont développé les, les vaccins. Euh, s'il était euh, illusoire de penser qu'elle partagerait ses brevets euh, avec euh, euh, des concurrents, euh, je pense que le monde entier s'attendait à ce qu'il y ait à tout le moins des collaborations, et on en a vu quelques-unes, des collaborations entre certaines compagnies pharmaceutiques pour que euh, des compagnies pharmaceutiques qui ne développent pas de vaccins puissent mettre à contribution leurs installations pour la production de vaccins euh, et faire en sorte d'accroître de, de, euh, l'approvisionnement euh, à l'échelle mondiale. Euh, il est préoccupant de voir que euh, les gouvernements, des gouvernements, euh, ont préféré préserver les, euh, je dirais, les privilèges ou les avantages euh, commerciaux de certaines entreprises plutôt que de chercher à euh, maximiser euh, la production des vaccins pour euh, euh, assurer l'approvisionnement sur l'ensemble de la planète. Mais... Euh, Plutôt que de nous renvoyer la balle et de chercher à distribuer les blâmes, euh, j'ai tendance à penser qu'il n'est pas trop tard pour bien faire, euh, parce qu'il ne sert à rien de pleurer sur le lait renversé et qu'il nous faut au contraire, rapidement, le plus rapidement possible, tenter de trouver des solutions pour euh, faire face euh, à, à, à ce qui vient. Euh, parce que si on constate que le monde a, a, a mal réagi au euh, premier signe de la pandémie, euh, il serait désolant que nous en arrivions à la conclusion que le monde a continué de mal réagir à toutes les étapes de la pandémie. Donc, nous avons encore l'occasion de euh, bien réagir à cette, à cette étape-ci de la pandémie. Mme McPherson le soulignait, je crois que c'est Mme Tam qui le disait, si tout le monde n'est pas euh, protégé, personne ne l'est. Et, et ça, ça inclut évidemment les, euh, nos... Euh, nos euh, nos congénères dans les pays en développement. Euh, donc, il faut nous assurer euh, solidairement, collectivement, euh, que l'ensemble de la communauté humaine partout sur la planète puisse être rapidement protégée. C'est non seulement la responsabilité des euh, gouvernements des pays en développement, mais c'est également notre responsabilité, puisque ce à quoi nous faisons face présentement, ce n'est pas à une crise qui affecte le Canada, c'est à une crise qui affecte l'ensemble de l'humanité. Et euh, je pense que nous avons à apprendre, des, et, et c'est un peu ce que je disais dans mon allocution d'ouverture, nous avons à apprendre des leçons, des euh, failles euh, de la réaction mondiale au premier jour, au premier mois de cette pandémie et qu'il ne nous faut pas euh, répéter les mêmes erreurs. Donc, plutôt que de chercher à préserver les avantages commerciaux des euh, entreprises, euh, évidemment sans les, sans les désavantager, considérant que euh, la production rapide de ces vaccins a occasionné des dépenses considérables pour ces compagnies, je pense que les gouvernements doivent euh, s'assurer que ces compagnies soient euh, dûment euh, compensées pour permettre effectivement une production beaucoup plus large et rapide des vaccins pour approvisionner, approvisionner le plus grand nombre de nos congénères partout dans le monde. Merci beaucoup, collègues. Uh, thank I, you very much. I may just uh, make a 30-second follow-up to that. I, I did want to mention that, you know, some percentages have been thrown around, and I just wanted to have the ability to say that year over year, we've been increasing uh, the amount that is um, provided for international assistance funding. Uh, in 2018, we committed more uh, than $3.4 in addition uh, to what was spent the previous years. Uh, we, like I've mentioned, $1.6 billion uh, just as of last February. That is, um, uh, that is con contributed to um, pandemic assistance. And um, from the years 2017 to 2019, our international assistance increased from $6.1 billion to $6.4 billion. Uh, Canada does prioritize, and I think we all prioritize, uh, the quality effectiveness uh, also of its assistance. And I did want to mention that um, 
you know, given the opportunity which has been given by the media previously to all the leaders of the party, uh, of different leaders uh, of different parties in this House, uh, no one leader has said that they would not um, take the option to procure vaccines for Canadians, vulnerable Canadians, uh, during through the COVAX agreements. And so, um, although I respect you know, the committee's views and all of the members here, uh, none of the parties in the House have openly stated that they would not do uh, the same. And it is an option that was always provided uh, through this agreement. Um, and I'd like to also say um, that I'm glad that we have like-minded individuals I'm in this committee when it comes to this study, um, you know, but it was also very shocking to see that in the last campaign, the Conservative, Party's, uh, Conservative Party campaigned on gutting international assistance completely. Um, so that was a little bit of a shame. And uh, I know that the government um, has been doing a lot, has been leading in this area, but is willing to do more as well uh, because we are all in it together and um, the vulnerabilities that have been exacerbated through this pandemic uh, are real and uh, we completely recognize that and we won't get out of this pandemic unless we all do it together. Mr. Sahoda, thank you very much. I don't Mr. Know Chair, if I could, my colleagues, I'm, I'm mindful yes. of the time, but I also want to give colleagues a chance to, to yeah. respond to what Ms. Sahoda just said. So maybe we can do a very brief round of uh, supplementary comments, uh, but then um, I'm mindful of the fact that we probably have other questions from the press corps, and I want to make sure that we have a chance to at least go to one more. Uh, Mr. Chong, please, briefly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'd like to respond to that. Um, I think it's true that for both Conservatives and Liberals, there's a gap between rhetoric and reality. Uh, for Conservatives, uh, the challenge is that our, our reality, our actions exceed our rhetoric. Uh, it is true in the last election campaign, the party promised to reduce uh, foreign aid expenditures by 25%. Um, that is not a commitment that we currently hold. Uh, it's not a commitment we currently believe in. It's not our current position. But the facts say otherwise. Uh, during the 10 years that the previous Conservative government was in power. Gross uh, foreign aid as a percentage of gross national income averaged 0.3%. Under the current government, it has averaged 0.27%. Those are incontrovertible facts. And it is an example of how, for Conservatives, our actions exceed our rhetoric. For the current government, there, there, there is a gap as well between their rhetoric and their actions. But it's in the opposite direction. This government came to office promising to help the poorest in the world, promising to do better in foreign aid, promising to do better in foreign policy. But the record shows otherwise. The current government has cut foreign aid by 10 percent. That is clearly indicated in the chart uh, in figure three on page 23 of the report. That is an incontrovertible fact. And so while both parties suffer the challenge of a gap between rhetoric and reality, I would put to you that actions are more important than words, and the Conservative record is clear on action. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chong, thank you very much. And if colleagues agree, perhaps we can go to, to one more question from the press corps. Would that be agreeable? Madam Clerk, uh, let's open the line for an additional question, please. Operator, could we have the next question, please? Thank you. Once again, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad if you have a question or comment. De nouveau, n'hésitez pas à faire étoile 1 pour toute question ou commentaire. There is no further question registered at this time. Il n'y a pas de question pour le moment. I would like to turn back the meeting over to the room. J'aimerais retourner l'appel à la chambre. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Um, I think we're within time to pot potentially have a brief round of closing remarks, two minutes each, if, if that's agreeable. Unless colleagues are constrained by their schedules, maybe we can go in the same order as we started, uh, just a two-minute closing statement, seeing that there are no further questions from the press. Uh, Ms. Sahota, Mr. Chong, Monsieur Bergeron, and Madam McPherson, please. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short as uh, I do need to jump on to another committee meeting, but I, I just want to say to all of the, uh, the witnesses, the NGOs and um, witnesses that uh, came before us and for this committee, uh, you know, they've provided us 
some great testimony and uh, the study is not over. Uh, I know that uh, we're continuing to learn a lot of valuable information as to what is going on around the world. Um, and I'm and I'm happy that we've been able to work together um, in committee to come up with good recommendations for the government, which I am confident uh, the government uh, will be responding to, will act on. Um, and I am pleased uh, that we have been increasing um, the amount that we are spending and that we are leading uh, when it comes to being involved, when it comes to education, uh, which we have heard is um, greatly, you know, has become a barrier uh, in many communities. Um, so we're working together with like-minded countries to make sure that access to education can be improved for the most vulnerable. Um, and much more to come. I know that uh, uh, through the upcoming budget, and there will be more announcements to be made. Uh, and I look forward uh, to hearing back from the government on the recommendations our committee has made um, so that we can continue being leaders uh, in our global community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sahota. Mr. Chong. Je veux dire merci à tous mes collègues sur le comité pour le travail. Et à vous aussi, Monsieur le Président, pour gérer notre comité. Ce n'est pas toujours facile de faire ça euh, avec les points de vue divergents. Um, je veux dire merci aussi. Um, I'd like to also thank um, the clerk of our committee, Erica Pereira, uh, and the excellent uh, work that she does, as well as the excellent work, the always excellent work from the experts at the research service of the Library of Parliament, Nadia Foce, uh, Alison Goody, and Billy Joe Sikursky. Um, they do excellent work, both on committee and otherwise, when we ask for their uh, guidance. Uh, and uh, so I'd like to thank all of them as well. Merci à tous. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chong. Monsieur Bajeron. Mais merci, Monsieur le Président. Je tâcherai d'être bref. Je veux simplement indiquer à la presse que je trouve un peu euh, étonnant et désolant d'une certaine façon que euh, cette conférence de presse ait pu donner l'impression aux, aux membres de la presse et éventuellement aux citoyens et aux citoyennes qui auront l'occasion euh, de, de voir cette conférence de presse, euh, qu'il y avait euh, des divergences. Il y a toujours des divergences, évidemment, entre les partis, mais que euh, ceux-ci n'ont pas travaillé de façon, euh, euh, je dirais, solidaire et euh, dans, la, dans la recherche de l'atteinte des meilleures conclusions et recommandations à formuler dans les circonstances. Et je tiens à réitérer le fait que euh, tout au long des travaux de ce comité, malgré les divergences de vues, nous avons travaillé euh, dans un esprit de collaboration qui force l'admiration et qui, je l'espérais, aurait pu se traduire à travers, à travers ce, cette conférence de presse. Mais euh, lorsque les projecteurs sont allumés, lorsque les cam caméras sont braquées, euh, comme le dit l'adage euh, français, euh, « chasser le naturel, il revient au galop ». Donc, euh, nous, nous, sont, nous, nous, avons, nous, nous avons retrouvé cet, euh, cet esprit plus combatif, euh, plus euh, conflictuel, qui euh, tente à caractériser dans l'esprit des gens les relations entre les partis. Mais je tiens à y réitérer, Monsieur le Président, que nous avons travaillé dans un esprit de collaboration tel que nous l'avons euh, souhaité dès le départ des travaux de ce comité. Et euh, je tenais à le souligner, euh, surtout après, euh, après ces échanges euh, un peu musclés euh, dans le cadre de cette conférence de presse. Et à mon tour, j'aimerais euh, vous remercier, Monsieur le Président, remercier la greffière, euh, le personnel de soutien et euh, bien sûr nos analystes qui euh, nous ont permis de, euh, de présenter ce rapport extrêmement euh, solide, je dirais, qui traduit bien les témoignages qui ont été faits euh, dans le cadre des travaux de ce comité et qui nous permettent à tous et à toutes euh, de présenter le meilleur côté de nous-mêmes euh, et j'espère que c'est ce, ce que les gens retiendront de ce comité, de ce rapport, c'est-à-dire euh, cet esprit de collaboration qui a présidé à la production de ce rapport, qui, je pense, est très important pour la suite des choses. Je vous remercie, M. le Président. Merci beaucoup, uh, M. Bergeron. Et uh, Ms. McPherson, pour vos closing remarks.
It may be that Ms. McPherson had to go to the house. She indicated that she had some other business. Uh, if she's had to step away, then um, I would just like to thank colleagues for joining us this morning. Thank our amazing House of Commons team, including our clerk and analysts, uh, technical supporters, interpreters, and uh, excellent round of discussion this morning. Thank you also to members of the press who connected with us. And I look forward to seeing colleagues at committee this afternoon. Merci beaucoup. Bonne journée. Thank you. And this concludes the press conference.